G'day, Matthew Wood here on Journeys to the Ice, the podcast of the Antarctic Research Centre. Coming up in this episode of the podcast... What would be an interesting record to add to those existing records around New Zealand is something that can combine what's happening on land and what's happening in the sea. One of the few proxies that can do that is palynology. The science of palynology considers palynomorphs, the pollen and spores of terrestrial plants, and the organic cysts of motile marine plankton known as dinoflagellates. These microfossils can be found incorporated into seafloor sediments and, uniquely among climate proxies, provide contemporaneous environmental information for both the land and the ocean. By correlating modern dinoflagellate assemblages to measured parameters of the overlying water column, well-dated fossil assemblages can then be used to derive numerical estimates of paleo-environmental conditions such as sea surface temperature, for specific times in the recent geological past. In his PhD research, Joe Preble wants to contribute to the understanding of how palynology is influenced by climate in the New Zealand region today. Using this relationship, he'll be able to gain a quantitative sense of the environmental conditions that prevailed during certain warm interglacial periods of the Quaternary, as documented in high-resolution sediment cores recently collected off eastern New Zealand. Thanks for joining us today, Joe. Welcome to the podcast and also welcome back to the Antarctic Research Centre. You've recently started your PhD here. What sort of work was it that you left in order to come back to university? I've been working for a consultancy company doing contaminated land and that sort of thing and decided that this was what I wanted to do instead. And your master's research that you completed at the ARC several years back, that was based on the core from the Cape Roberts project, right? Yeah, for my master's I was looking at the palynology, so the pollen and the spores and the dinoflagellates from the Cape Roberts project, which is drilled on the Antarctic margin. And the intervals that I was looking at were in the early Oligocene and the later Oligocene. We were trying to document how the vegetation had changed between those two times. So I suppose that work really set the stage for what would become your PhD research. Yes, well, it's a continuation of the same skill of using a microscope, I suppose. What really got me into looking at quaternary palynology was that I got to the end of my master's, having spent all this time documenting all this pollen, and Peter Barrett, my supervisor, said, so how warm was it? And I thought, well, I don't know. I've got lots of pollen. I've got lots of dinoflagellates. But it's anyone's guess. And at the time, I put some vague constraints around it, as you obviously can. It was warmer than zero degrees because it wasn't frozen. There was plants, and it was cooler than tropical because there weren't palm trees. But ever since then, one of the things that's really been interesting me is how people manage to get a temperature from a quantitative fossil assemblage. It's really intriguing, and that's really what's driving me to do this PhD. So briefly, what is the scope of your PhD research and what are the overarching objectives that you've established? Well, I want to investigate climate variation during the Quaternary, with a particular emphasis on investigating how the climate varied during warm interglacial periods. There's about 15 glacial interglacial cycles over the last million years or so, and of those, three or four appear to be as warm as the present or slightly warmer. So I'm interested in investigating them partly as an analogue for what the world might look like in the future, in a warming world. I suppose looking at the quaternary in many ways isn't a good analogue for what the future is going to be like, because the last million years has carbon dioxide fluctuating at pre-industrial levels. So if you want to find out how the Earth system might have responded to carbon dioxide at higher levels, or even the levels are at present, then you can go and study the Pliocene or go back and study the Eocene for a very high carbon dioxide scenario. But I suppose the sort of information that you get out of studying the quaternary interglacials is some feeling for the variability in the Earth system in a normal carbon dioxide world, but you've got the advantage that your atmospheric circulation and your continents and your oceans are in roughly the same position as present. So you, you get a feeling for how much the normal world can vary before you put an increase of carbon dioxide over the top of it. Now, one of these warm Pleistocene interglacials that is a focus of your research is marine isotope stage 11. So this is 420 to 360,000 years ago. What makes this interglacial particularly interesting in the context of your study? So the interesting things about stage 11 are that it's a 
period of time which has got long, fairly stable climatic conditions that seem to be a lot like what we've had for the last 10,000 years, Holocene conditions. And it has fairly similar orbital configurations to the present. So it has similar amounts of solar energy hitting most parts of the Earth. And around the New Zealand region, there are no records of what the terrestrial conditions were. Or rather, there is one record of pollen collected from right out in the deep ocean, which is so far away that it's surprising even that pollen really has got there. And there are about three records of sea surface conditions derived from ORAM transfer functions. And what would be an interesting record to add to those existing records around New Zealand is something that can combine what's happening on land and what's happening in the sea. One of the few proxies that can do that is palynology, because you can look at your pollen and your spores that are derived from your trees on land, and you can look at your dinoflagellate record, which are microscopic algae, which happen to be formed by the same sort of stuff that pollen is. And so both of these things, a proxy from the land and a proxy from the sea, come out into the same sample. So you can look at exactly the same time in a geological sample and say roughly what's happening on land and what's happening in the sea at the same time. Throughout these podcasts, the people that I interview point out again and again that the New Zealand region is really this sort of key area in the world for studying paleoclimate, particularly with regard to things like the relative influence of the Northern Hemisphere and Antarctica, changes in atmospheric circulation and the migration of ocean fronts, for example. Now, for your paleo record, you'll be using IODP site 1352. Now, this is the record-breaking Integrated Ocean Drilling Program core retrieved by the Geordies Resolution in January of this year off the Canterbury coast. Why is this specific core location ideal for your study? Well, the sort of questions that we want to answer are how terrestrial changes relate to oceanic changes. So to be able to get any idea of the terrestrial changes, we have to have pollen that's come from a tree and gone down a river or through the air and ended up in the sedimentary record. So we wanted to get a record that's reasonably close to the land, a sure proximal record, and that we can get a reasonably high resolution record out of, and that there's quite a high sedimentation rate. The other record that I'm going to look at as well as this near shore record, as I want to step further offshore, east of New Zealand, out to Site 594, which will be further from land, but should have a better oceanic record. Now, of course, before you can begin to make sense of a paleoclimate record at any sort of quantitative level, you need to have an understanding of the modern setting. So, in the context of your study, you need to have some sort of suite of modern analogues for any potential fossil palynomorph assemblage that you might find in a core. Because of course it's only in recent historical times that we've been able to take direct measurements of any environmental or climatic parameters that we might be interested in. Now without getting too bogged down in all the complex mathematics that are obviously involved, could you talk a little bit about the statistical tool of transfer functions and how you plan to go about generating them for your research? Well, I suppose if you want to know what the sea surface temperature was in a paleo record, there's a couple of main ways that you can go about it. You can use geochemistry, like magnesium calcium, for instance, or you can use faunal assemblages, which can be assemblages of foraminifera or radiolarian or dinoflagellates or diatoms. All of those approaches, whether they're using shell chemistry or faunal assemblages, require that they be calibrated to a modern environment So underpinning the magnesium calcium is the observation that in modern 4M shells, the magnesium concentrations change with sea surface water temperature. And so when you want to reconstruct sea surface conditions using faunal assemblages, you need to start by seeing how the relative abundance of the different taxa, different species, you need to see how they change in the modern environment. So we do that by taking as many samples as we can from as many different seafloor settings as we can. For some fossil groups, like foraminifera, there's been a lot of work over the last 20 years collecting the extensive archive of seafloor sediments, and they have 1,500 or 2,000 seafloor sites, at least, from around the world. Other fossil groups are catching up, and different fossil groups have got different advantages and disadvantages for trying to understand your sea surface conditions. So things like foraminifera have got various dissolution problems with depth, 
others occur less frequently at high latitudes or low latitudes, and so you can get less reliable sea condition reconstructions from them. So the fossil group that I'm looking at are dinoflagellates, which are marine algae. Some of them are photosynthetic, so they produce their own food, and others are heterotrophic, so they eat other bugs. Some of them are both. They are quite a mixed group, but what they do once in a while is they form cysts as part of their life cycle, sometimes once a year, sometimes during times of environmental stress. Frequently these cysts will sink to the seafloor on the shelf, so two, three hundred metres water depth, where they can be remobilised, hatch out and go on with their living. These cysts are formed from a resistant organic, I think it's a carbohydrate based stuff, a lot like pollen, which can be preserved into the rock record. So to take a step back, what we want to try to do is take a bunch of samples from as wide of environmental gradients as possible, and then from other sources get environmental measurements for each place where we've collected a sample from. So measurements of sea surface temperature, for instance, or um, productivity perhaps, and then relate the faunal assemblages on the seafloor to the environmental conditions. And once you've done that, you need to try to demonstrate which environmental conditions seem to be influencing the distribution of your species most significantly. And once you've got that, then you can use one of a number of different statistical transfer functions to try to reconstruct from a given fossil assemblage what the environmental parameters would be. And it's probably worth mentioning that when we say modern seafloor sediment sample, we really mean roughly Holocene-aged seafloor sediment sample because, of course, you've defined modern as being up to 7,000 years old. Well, I suppose it's sort of a modern of necessity rather than reality. To get your sample off the seafloor, they've been collected sometimes by grab samples, which collect up to sort of 10 centimetres or 20 centimetres from the seafloor. Ideally, you take the top of a multi-core sampler, which you can get a very discreet sample from the top centimetre of the ocean floor. You know that whatever's on top is the youngest. Even once you've got that, you still don't know that whatever the youngest sediment is, is modern because there are large parts of the ocean where there hasn't been any significant sedimentation, perhaps since the last glacial. There are other places where there's erosion, so you again end up with sediment that's too old. So I suppose in the ideal world, we'd go for the youngest sediment we could. Going for a 7,000 year cutoff is really just pragmatic, as much as anything. A great many seafloor assemblages don't have very much age control at all, and we've been lucky that we've got a bunch of carbon-14 dates, so we've got at least some feeling for how old some of them are. Now in terms of the distribution of those modern seafloor sediment samples, I saw in your PhD proposal that you originally had this quite broad spread of sample locations across the Southwest Pacific, the Southern Ocean, and the Tasman Sea. It was basically covering the wider New Zealand region all the way from the tropics down to Antarctica. But I'm looking now at some of the updated maps you've brought in today, and it looks like maybe that situation has changed. Well, that's right. Ideally, what we'd like to have is a range of modern samples that go all the way from zero degrees up to 30 degrees sea surface temperature. And we'd have a nice continuous environmental gradient that we have analog samples for. Unfortunately, life doesn't quite work out like that. So the scatter of samples that I had all the way from about 10 degrees south down to about 60 degrees south, turns out that most of them didn't have very many dinoflagellates in them. So... What I've ended up with is a much tighter distribution of samples with a temperature range of about 7 degrees to about 22 degrees or something like that. Because as you mentioned in your proposal, dinoflagellates are particularly prevalent in the neuritic zone, so this is continental shelf depths. So I guess perhaps it's not surprising that the absolute abundances of dinoflagellate cysts dropped off significantly for those sample locations that were far from the New Zealand landmass. Because of their life cycle that involves the formation of a cyst sinking to the sea floor, most of the dinoflagellate species are more abundant in shelf areas. There are a bunch of species that are oceanic, which have got some adaption in their life cycle that involves either a very brief encystment phase, just long enough for them to sink a brief distance before they would hatch out and come back to the surface. But that hasn't really been studied very well. There are dinoflagellate cysts that appear to be found only in the Southern Ocean, which is nowhere near land and nowhere near the shelf. But yes, the observation that most of them appear to need to be on the shelf for most of their life cycle has led to quite a few people suggesting that dinoflagellates probably should be used with caution as a paleoenvironmental tool when you get into deeper waters because there's a very real risk that a lot of them in deeper waters didn't live their lives in the sea surface directly above their site. They've been possibly reworked a great distance from the shore. And we should probably point out that even when you are lucky enough to get an abundance of dinoflagellate cysts, 
it's then an incredibly time consuming effort to look down the microscope and point count hundreds and hundreds of these things to get truly representative proportions for your assemblages. Yes, so every sample that we look at, it's quite a long laboratory process just to get them to a stage where they can be looked at down a microscope. They need to have all of the carbonate removed that's dissolved in hydrochloric acid, then all of the rock, all the silica material is removed by dissolving it in hydrofluoric acid, then it's sieved and put in an ultrasonic tank for a little while to disaggregate the material, and then it's mounted on a glass cover slip. And we look at it down a light microscope and try to count at least 300 dinoflagellate cysts for every sample location, which some places where there's lots of them, that's a short, painless exercise, and sometimes where there's very few, it's too hard to finish. That's really why my data set has gone from having a 60 degree spread down to about a 40 degree spread. So we've talked about the modern dinoflagellate assemblages. So that's half of the transfer function explained. How about the corresponding modern numerical environmental data? Where does that come from? So the um, environmental data that's available, there are two sources really that have got any really good global coverage. One of them is called the World Ocean Atlas, which is a compilation of environmental measurements. So pretty much any data that's been collected since 1890 from anywhere in the world goes into this database. Measurements of sea surface temperature and also temperatures all the way down whenever they've done a CTD drop anywhere in the ocean. And it measures measurements of salinity and nitrates, phosphate and chlorophyll. What the database doesn't include is any satellite observations. So it's only dominated by measurements that were made from about the 1970s to about the late 80s. And so it's the database that is most commonly used in paleoclimate reconstructions using faunal distributions. So the other source of information are satellites measuring environmental conditions. There's been two satellites, one through the 90s and one for the last 10 years. They provide measurements of sea surface temperature and ocean colour. And from the ocean colour, you can infer what the productivity might be for any part of the ocean by relating the ocean colour to the temperature. And there's a bunch of work about how far they differ from reality. And the place where they seem to particularly fall down is when you get close to shore, even onto the shelf, because the measurement of colour changes as you get more sediment in your water as well. So land runoff can muck around with your ocean colour quite a bit. I mean, I've got a bunch of numbers for every single site. You can put a number on anything and it can tell me that I've got a thousand milligrams per square metre of carbon fixed per day. But it's another step to work out whether that's actually remotely close to reality or not. And other studies, particularly on the west coast of the states, have used measurements of chlorophyll in production rather than relying on satellites. So I guess there are two big assumptions when building this transfer function. Firstly, there's the assumption that the modern setting is sufficiently representative of the processes and conditions of the past, or the mid-Pleistocene at least. And you touched on the other big assumption before, you know, have these assemblages of dinoflagellates really rained out of the overlying water column? And the assumption that there hasn't been significant lateral transport or reworking is what everything really hinges on, I guess. How have you gone about testing this assumption? Right, so the way I would like to try to address how much these dinoflagellate cysts have been reworked in the deep water is by observing how much pollen and terrestrially derived microscopic organic matter is there as well. So in samples where there's large amounts of pollen and large amounts of terrestrially derived material in the deep ocean, it's possible that a lot of the cysts are also derived from land as well. Sediment traps are a bucket a couple of metres high and a, at a metre across, a bucket with a funnel. And Scott Nodder at Niwa has had a sediment trap programme going for the last 10 years where he has two traps, one moored north of the Chatham Rise, well off the coast of Castle Point, and another one south of the Chatham Rise, well off the coast of Dunedin. These traps are fixed to the seafloor and moored at about 1,500 metres water depth. So what these traps do is anything that's raining down through the water column collects in the funnel and it goes through to a little cup at the bottom, which is filled with a poison that kills any bugs and preserves them. And every two weeks or so, the little engine shifts the carousel around and fills up another cup. And they go out on the Tangaroa, the Niwa research boat every six months. And you pull up the traps and empty the puddles and put some new ones out. This has created this really quite amazing time series that shows how productivity in the surface waters is being exported to the seafloor. And I've been given a chance to have a look at some of this material 
Initially, I thought it was going to help me answer questions about how much reworking there is. If my seafloor assemblage directly below the trap doesn't match with what's in the trap, then perhaps the seafloor sediment has been reworked. But the time scales are really just so different. You know, these traps are 10 years, whereas my seafloor sediment could be anything up to many hundreds of years or a few thousand years. So what I'm using them to do now is try to get some understanding of the seasonality of the dinoflagellates life cycles. So just to find out what time of year these things form their cysts. There's massive spring blooms, particularly north of the Chatham Rise. Basically there's very little export production, very little stuff is going down through the water column for 10 months of the year and then you get to October and there's great big photosynthetic blooms on the sea surface and then you get massive amounts of organic material landing in the sediment traps days after. And then it goes quiet again for a few months and then you get another bloom in autumn. So I'd like to be able to work out what time of year the dinoflagellates are forming their cysts. And the whole point of that is that you can have a bit more confidence when creating a paleo record. Do I use a moon annual temperature or do I use an autumn temperature? Which doesn't change it much, but it changes the number you'd use by a few degrees. So it's early days in terms of your project. You've still got a lot of work ahead of you. But what do you think is perhaps the biggest contribution that this project will eventually make to paleoclimate science in New Zealand? I suppose one of the things that we don't really know is when conditions change on land, what's happening in the ocean at exactly the same time. We've got lots of records of what's happened in the ocean, and we've got fewer records, but still records of what's happening on land in some cases, but we don't have any records of how the two change, whether they change at the same time or whether the ocean leads the land or the other way around. So being able to get that coupled record, I think is the main value in looking at both pollen and dinoflagellates from around New Zealand. For more journeys to the ice, visit cyblogs.co.nz forward slash journeys to the ice. <laughs>